One of my Patreon supporters sent me an image that they had taken with some very modest equipment and I wanted to see uh, how good of an image I could get with some simple processing in PixInsight. Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. So one of my Patreon supporters sent me an image and he ended up sending me the raw image that he had taken with modest equipment, which was a Canon 60D that was Astro modded, an Optolong L Enhance filter and a Canon 200mm f2.8 lens. Of course, uh, when you take everything together, it's not exactly cheap, but it's not like the price of some uh, very advanced Astro rigs that we see many people. I would say maybe including myself uh, use so I would still say it's very modest equipment I'm actually not even sure what the mount was but uh, I know that he was working unguided he does not have a guide scope and a guide cam so based on that what can I do in my favorite piece of software to process astrophotos which is PixInsight uh, PixInsight, by the way, it's a very expensive piece of software, but it's buy once, own it forever, including like updates. And it has truly changed the game from my astrophotography uh, when I bought it, I think like five years ago. It's, uh, it's an amazing piece of software, although it can be a bit difficult to use, let's say a bit of a steep learning curve at first. Anyway, we are in PixInsight and here is the image. Let's have a first look at the image and I am just going to do a simple screen transfer function that is going to be unlinked. This is a color image with a DSLR camera. And immediately we can see that we have the flaming star nebula, we have the tadpoles nebula, the spider nebula, whatever this star cluster is. And it's looking pretty uh, pretty decent to be, uh, to be honest. Let's uh, zoom into this and we can see that we had some tracking issues in there. Now I'm not a pixel peeper, I really don't care about star shapes and neither should you. <laughs> well no, you, you, you care about whatever you want. Uh, but um, let's see, how do the star shapes look like in the corners? They're, they're like pretty pretty uniform across the frames, they're starting to get a bit like comets in the corners, but really not bad at all for an f2.8 lens. Uh, but what this means with those star shapes, which indicate tracking issues, it means that the features of the nebula have been uh, blurred out quite a bit. So I'd say like probably if I go to the tadpoles, there they are, they're barely visible because they've been blurred out by the poor tracking. So when you blur out the features of your nebula, you increase the noise of your image decrease the signal to noise ratio by blurring the signal. And I will try to recover that a little bit with deconvolution. But first I can see there are some stacking artifacts there. So we are going to use dynamic crop to crop the image. So I just double click on dy dynamic crop, drag and drop uh, here to set a square to look at. And we're gonna validate using the validate checkbox or check mark here and now we have a better image to process. Now there is a gradient, an obvious gradient on that image. It's like greenish here and darkish red here, which means I want to use the automated background extractor from uh, the processes. I love this process and it's a process that not enough people use in my opinion. Um, the uh, automatic background extractor there, the most important option is the function degree. And it is the polynomial degree of the function 2D function, the two variable function that is going to be used to model the background of your image. Uh, long story short, if you have a perfectly uniform background, you want to use a function degree of zero. If you have a linear background, like a gradient, like we see here, you want to choose a function degree of one. If you have something like vignetting, you want to use function degree of two. And generally you don't want to use more. I mean, you can feel feel free to play around until you find like the right function degree for you. I'm going to just select one and I'm going to say that I want to subtract um, that uh, background and we're going to discard the background mo mo model, replace the target image and I'm going to apply that to the image. Okay, let's apply a screen transfer function and we can see that immediately things are much better and something like a dynamic background extraction might probably have done too much work and try to model the background a bit too well and we'd see some inconsistencies in how it removed the background. So that's why I'm a big fan of the automatic uh, background extractor. Anyway, uh, 
This is done. Let's go to the next step, and our next step is going to be deconvolution. For that, I'm going to, I'm going to use a script from the uh, free uh, easy processing suite, uh, which I've presented in the past. I'll put links down below if you want to install it on your Pixin site, and we're going to use easy decon. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to set a preview here and a preview there. And now we're going to go into the script and do easy decon. Now, easy decon, uh, first we need to create a processed star mask. I'm just going to click create new process star mask and it's going to use uh, Starnet++, which is a machine learning slash AI based program that can detect and remove uh, stars. And now that it's done, I am just going to create a background mask. Then we can go inside the deconvolution tab. I'm going to generate a point spread function, PSF. It's basically an average of your star shape across the image. It can take a bit of time to generate, especially on such a big image with so many stars. So let's wait for this to be done. Okay, and we're done and we can see a pretty accurate representation of the average star. And this is going to be used to kind of infer um, a way to sharpen the nebula into what it should have been without the tracking issues. So what we're going to do is I'm going to click here and select one of my previews, let's say preview two, which is on the tadpoles here. And we're going to set, yeah, decon iterations, let's start at 50. And pixel math iterations, I believe the default is five. I like to increase that to avoid kind of halos around the stars. So, and then I'm just going to click on evaluate easy decon run, and we're going to see how well it does on this particular preview. And let's see, so this is uh, after the decon, this is before, we can see that structures there are much clearer. Uh, this is much better. And let's see the tadpoles themselves, not so much sharper, but a bit better it seems to me. So a small change, but still it's something that I like. And we could play around with the settings here until we get something better. I'm a bit too lazy for that. I'm just gonna run the easy decon on the full image. Okay, and we're done with our deconvolution. This is the image as it looks like uh, now. And normally I'd go inside my script and run easy denoise, but I'm feeling a bit lazy today, so I'm not gonna do that. We're just going to go directly and do some stretching. So we are gonna stretch the image into a nonlinear image. So let's do that. And uh, doesn't it look quite good already? I mean, this is this is something that I'd be very happy with to start with. Uh, it's just I think a lot of people want to get like the blue in the areas of the flaming star, the tadpoles, the spider here. And this is what we're going to do. So first things first, I am actually going to use this button here to um, separate red, green, and blue channels. And because this was taken through the L enhance filter, we can say that R for red is H for H alpha. It's the H alpha uh, wavelength from the nebula. And then green and blue, we are going to merge them to have oxygen three. They're kind of like oxygen three and H beta at the same time, but uh, I'm just going to merge them together. So we're gonna use pixel math for that. And we are going to do uh, blue times one third plus G times uh, two third. And uh, we're just uh, doing an average, a weighted average uh, of the channels. And I'm using uh, more for green because there's more green pixels on the camera sensor to start with, twice as much as there are blue pixels. Uh, in terms of a destination, we're gonna create a new image and I'm just gonna apply that using the square. And this is what we get. And I'm calling this O for oxygen three. Now, what I am going to do is merge this H and O. So to do that, I'm again going to use pixel math and I'm gonna set the red channel is gonna be H. And then I'm gonna uncheck the use a single RGBK expression. I'm gonna say the red channel is gonna be H times 0 0.2 plus O times 0 0.8. So mostly oxygen three. And the blue channel is O. And we're gonna create a new image, except that this time it's gonna be an RGB color image. So now we have um, our image with slightly different colors than before. And we can see that the areas that we want to become blue is actually, are actually kind of like the brighter areas in the image, which is kind of what we uh, want to accomplish. Now I'm gonna do something. I am going to run Starnet++ 
to remove the stars on all of those images and at the same time I want to create I want to retain the color stars because I'll be reintroducing them later so first I'm gonna run starnet on the black and white H and O files without creating star masks and here we are and then I'm going to do the same thing on the color image uh, while creating star masks because those stars are something I will want to reintroduce into the image later and here we are our star mask is here I'm gonna put it in icon for now and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play with the oxygen uh, image I'm gonna use some histogram and I can I could use a range mask as well but I'm gonna try with histogram I'm gonna select uh, O I'm gonna open a preview for O and I want to keep only like the brighter areas like so this is pretty good those areas will basically have some uh, oxygen 3 kind of uh, blue color and the red part the, the ones that mix with H alpha will become kind of magenta now depending on people's tastes this might, might be good or bad it really is up to you let's uh, just apply that and then I'm gonna blur that mask and I'm gonna use a convolution for that so just convolution standard dev, dev of maybe like 15 there it is it's blurred and I'm going to apply this on the image now I'm gonna uh, stop showing the mask so now we are masking all of the other areas except the ones that we want to use our oxygen 3 to turn to blue I'm going to go inside a curves transformation and uh, we are going to select um, a actually B and we are going to select uh, the preview here and uh, the curve B and I'm gonna lower the value on the curve B and you can see that immediately we're getting our color, our blue color that we want. We can also play with the curve A and I'm gonna drag it down as well until I get like kind of like the color that I want. And I can also play with the uh, blue curve and drag it up a little bit and also play with the green curve. And depending on which color I want to get, I can really play with the green to see uh, the uh, the color that I like. I'm also going to play with the C curve, which is the chroma curve, to get a bit more of an impact. And we could add some saturation as well as uh, as needed. So that's it for adding this uh, color into the image. And we're adding it based on existing Oxygen 3 data. Now you could also like choose how you add it and where you add it depends on your histogram transformation. I could have been uh, more generous with the histogram transformation to include more areas of the nebula uh, into that blue transformation. We're not doing that here. And I can do actually something very similar for the H alpha. I can go inside my histogram tra transformation, select um, H for the curve, and I'm going to open a preview, and we're going to do something very similar. I think uh, a stretch like this, this is not bad. We're going to apply it to the H alpha, and again, I'm going to apply the convolution to blur uh, the image. I might actually make the convolution a bit stronger. Yep, not bad. And now I'm going to apply it instead of the other mask. And we're going to play again with curves. I'm going to open up a preview. And we can play with B to change the, the H alpha as we like. We can play with A to change the H alpha kind of as we like. We can play with like a lot of those colors here as necessary and as you like. So it's really up to you what color you like, what um, it, it's like the whole point of narrowband is really that you can play with it to obtain whatever, you know, results you, uh, you enjoy personally. And for example, let's say that I like this, I'm just going to apply this uh, to the image. The H alpha is much punchier now, but we still have the nice contrast with oxygen three. And um, I can do a lot of things now. We could reintroduce the stars and call it a day. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this image as a TIFF file. And now that I've saved it as a TIFF file, I'm going to open up, open it up in Topaz Denoise. And here it is. I've opened it up in Topaz Denoise. I'm using an old version of Topaz Denoise because I actually paid to um, uh, update, upgrade Topaz Denoise, but I, I felt like I was getting worse results with the new version. Uh, so I, I went back to the old one and I like to use AI clear at a medium or high setting and then we can recover the details to some extent something like this and uh, this like re resolves a lot of the noise issues 
that we might have with the image, but we also want to make sure that it doesn't introduce detail that didn't exist in the first place. So I like to kind of double check that it's not the case or there's not, nothing too egregious in the matter. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time here, but it's basically playing with remove noise and recover details and, until you find a right balance. And I'm just going to save as another TIFF file. Now I can just open that new TIFF file from Topaz Denoise within PixInsight. So you can see it's basically the same image but denoised. And I could try, like I think if the image was a bit better quality um, without like the, the star trading that we saw, I might use a bit of multi-scale medium transform. Typically like for me level 4 at 0 0.01 like sharpens the image a tiny bit. Uh, but again, this is something that we could spend some time playing with until we get a nice sharp image that we like. Now I'm going to use pixel math again to reintroduce my stars. So I'm going to double click here and we're going to go back to a single RGBK expression. I'm going to set $t for target and I'm going to say plus star mask, star underscore mask, which is this image here. So we're just saying that uh, that my target image will have these stars added to it. And so I can just use the apply to my target, which is the denoised image. And there we are, we're getting a new image with the stars back. The stars are a bit aggressive in terms of the kind of detract from the nebula. So now I'm just going to go inside the easy processing suite and we can do some easy star reduction. And uh, we need to, uh, I'm gonna, just gonna set maybe morphological selection for the higher, the more the stars will be reduced, which can make the image look noisier as well. So it's kind of a fine compromise there. I'm gonna set three and just run the easy star reduction. And here we are, we have the result here. I kind of like this image. It doesn't look uh, too bad. Let me uh, actually open it up on another workspace. So we have it on its own without all of those process icons. And yeah, I mean, I like this. This looks um, really neat. And I think we could like, you know, play a bit more with curves, adjust this, the contrast, the saturation. So, you know, it's, it's always a lot of uh, fiddling that you can do with your images. I'm personally never ever satisfied with uh, my images. So, you know, it's like, it's really up to your taste and and you know how you can get satisfied with your images but let's say you want to punch your image we could just do a quick contrast curve with some more saturation we get this end result and i quite like this but this is basically what i wanted to show today like how we can process an image that's been taken with very like with relatively modest equipment and without any guiding, so we had tracking issues, this kind of stuff, and I personally like the results. And with that, this is pretty much all that I wanted to show in this uh, video. So as always, thank you so much for watching. Uh, don't forget, if you like astronomy, astrophotography, and your new channel, you may want to consider subscribing, clicking that bell icon as well. You may, while you're on your way, leave a like or a dislike if that's your jam on the video, as well as a comment to let me know how you did or what you would have done differently on this particular image. Also, let's say if you're a, a Patreon supporter um, or a YouTube member of the channel and you have an image that you desperately want me to try to process, you may contact me via like Instagram or directly Patreon, uh, for instance. Uh, I have links uh, down below. And uh, I can't guarantee that I'm going to process and feature your image, but uh, I just might. Uh, and I, I really want to reserve it to my supporters because uh, otherwise I just get overwhelmed. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, and uh, even then, like I probably won't be uh, doing more than a couple of images like a month maybe. So don't, don't get your hopes up, but it is something that we could do. If you do send me an, an image with raw data on something like Instagram, please let me know your YouTube member name so I can double check it. Uh, but that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty much all. So again, thank you so much for watching. More important than all of that is to never uh, forget to look up at the stars whenever you can, and I'll see you next time.